Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. ago, I was shaken awake by a figure of an elderly woman leaning over me in my bed. It scared me so much that I rolled across our bed and over my husband and ended up on the floor. I would see her occasionally in the hallway when I would get up during the night to go to the kitchen. She would just pass me and disappear into our hallway closet. I saw her several times standing over my bed and decided that I had to try and communicate with her. The last time I saw her, I told her she needed to move on. She disappeared into the closet, as usual, and has not been seen since. After that incident, I became a firm believer in the other side. A few months later, I woke up in the middle of the night and saw an apparition standing at the end of my bed. He was around 40 years old and dressed in clothing that would have been appropriate around the turn of the century. I remember he was wearing beige overalls and a flannel shirt. He was glowing and suspended about six feet above the ground, just staring at me. He had a totally evil presence about him, and I was terrified. Over the next few days, I would be fast asleep and would be woken by the bed being kicked repeatedly at the end. If I ignored him long enough, he would start walking on the bed. I was absolutely terrified. Then. Suddenly, the visits ended, and I started to relax. I've had several things happen to me since. If you're ever traveling through Alabama during your vacation time, you may find yourself face to face with the very essence of evil, a place called Sloss Furnaces. This dark and grisly place from 1882 to 1971 transformed coal and ore from surrounding acres into the hard steel that would pave the way for industry. From skyscrapers in New York to cars being built in Detroit, America came to rely on Sloss Furnaces for providing materials needed to produce thousands of products. But this success came at a dangerously high price. In the early 1900s, James Slag Wormwood was foreman of the graveyard shift, the period between sunset and sunrise, where a crew of nearly 150 workers toiled to keep the furnace fed. During the summer months, temperatures throughout the plant would reach more than 100 degrees. Lack of sleep, the heat and low visibility made working the furnace literally a living hell, and only the poorest of workers would work it. Wormwood, a cruel overseer, would make his workers take dangerous risks, forcing them to speed up production. During his reign, nearly 50 workers lost their lives, 
10 times more than any other shift in the history of the furnace. Countless others lost their ability to work due to accidents, mishaps, and even a recorded explosion in the small blowing engine house in the late 1880s that left several workers burned and blind. In October of 1906, James Slag Wormwood lost his footing at the top of the highest blast furnace, known as Big Alice, and plummeted into a pool of melted iron ore. His body melted instantly. It was reported that Slag must have become dizzy from the methane gas created by the furnace and lost his balance. But Slag had never set foot on top of furnaces during his years of employment many believed that the workers had finally had enough of Wormwood's slave driving and fed him into the furnace, but no workers were ever brought to trial. Sloss Industries soon discontinued the graveyard shift, citing numerous reports of accidents and strange incidents that decreased steel production. But the legend of slag grew each year after his disappearance, Workers complained of an unnatural presence they increasingly encountered throughout the plant. A night watchman in the early 1920s sustained injuries after being pushed from behind and told angrily by a deep voice to get back to work. The man could find no sign of any other living person near the furnace that night. In 1947, three supervisors turned up missing found unconscious and locked in the small boiler room in the southeast part of the plant, none of the three could explain exactly what happened to them. But they all agreed they were approached by a man whose skin appeared badly burned and who angrily shouted at them to push some steel. Probably the most horrifying tale occurred in 1971, when the night before the plant closed, Samuel Blumenthal, the Sloss security guard, who was taking a last look around the furnace, found himself face to face with the most frightening thing he had ever seen. He described it simply as evil, a half-man and half-demon who tried to push him up the stairs. When Blumenthal refused, the monster began to beat on him with his fists. Upon examination by Dr. Jack Barlow, Blumenthal was found covered with intense burns. He died soon afterwards. There have been more than 100 reports of suspected paranormal activity at Sloss Furnaces recorded in Birmingham police records. From minor incidents, such as steam whistles apparently blowing by themselves, to major sightings and the rare physical assault. It is interesting to note that most of these reports happen in the months of September and October at night during the old graveyard shift. So. If you ever find yourself roaming Sloss Furnaces at night, don't make the mistake of believing that you are alone. The ghosts of the past are still toiling away. Los Angeles, the city of Hollywood, a city that has its fair share of horrors, but this horrific hospital is one place you would not want to visit in the middle of the night alone. The Linda Vista Community Hospital, located in the Boyle Heights area of Los Angeles, originally opened as the Santa Fe Coastlines Hospital. Built in 1904 at a cost of $147,000 and opening in 1905, the hospital was used as the main medical facility in the area for employees of the Santa Fe Railroad. The hospital was designed to be a pleasant, safe place where employees received the best care available. The hospital, under the direction of Dr. N. H. Morrison, also raised its own cows, chickens, and vegetable gardens so that patients were provided with the freshest milk, eggs, and produce possible. But by 1937, ownership had left the railroad company, and the hospital was now open to the public under the name Linda Vista Community Hospital. Shortly after this change, the hospital took a turn for the worse. The neighborhood began rapidly declining. By the late 1970s and early 1980s, 
gangs had taken over this section of East L.A., flooding the hospital with violence and gunshot victims. More and more patients were being admitted who did not have insurance. The hospital was becoming blighted with urban decay. By 1988, the hospital began refusing ambulance service, and Linda Vista ceased operations as a medical facility for good in 1991. Many believed it was the high death rate of patients that led to the closure. The hospital was abandoned and fell into disrepair. It has been this way ever since. Hollywood soon discovered the decaying hospital and it became a filming location. Many Hollywood movies were filmed here, including End of Days and Pearl Harbor. Even ER visited the site for their pilot episode. It was its usage as a filming location that allowed stories of the hospital's haunted horrors to grow. Film crews and overnight security all reported myriad strange events and happenings. Screams, cries, moans, and humming were heard by many. Darting shadows and flickering lights were observed, even from outside of the building. An eerie, faint green light was seen. A foul odor was smelled on the third floor. People have been touched or pushed by unseen and cold hands. The elevators tend to malfunction, and cold spots are felt, especially near the entrance lobby. Those who have been inside the hospital rarely return for a second visit. There are also actual apparition sightings. A doctor wearing a tie is seen looking out a corner window on the top floor. This is said to be the spirit of a doctor who was killed after failing to save a gangbanger in the 1980s. A young woman has been observed pacing the third floor hallways, and an orderly is seen throughout, making his rounds. Some have even seen the image of a formal mental patient in what is described as the cage room. However, the most famous ghost is said to be the spirit of a young girl who possibly was struck by a car. She is heard giggling and is often seen out front by the hospital's sign or in the surgical room. The Linda Vista Community Hospital still stands. Those who are in the Boyle Heights area will know of its reputation and will probably warn you to avoid this location. But if you do find yourself in the middle of the night wandering around Los Angeles, it would be advisable for you to stay clear of this hospital horror. Perhaps confine yourself to your hotel room if you are a sleepwalker. Have you ever been lonely? Ever wondered if you are truly alone? Sometimes the places we visit can be alive with activity. And this is a place that must have felt lonely, and a place that still feels alive. It's a sanitarium in Michigan, where many lost their lives, and according to some people, it is a place where many patients still reside, beyond the grave. A 45,000-square-foot institutional facility made up of a variety of brick buildings and left in a state of neglect, complete with broken windows, sat in the middle of a well-kept neighborhood. This sanitarium was in Kalamazoo, Michigan. The neighbors hated walking past the building, not because the building was dilapidated, but because they say it gave off an aura, an aura that frightened even the hardened late-night walkers. Parents would tell their children never to go near the tortured building. Many locals say they felt like they were being watched from the building's broken windows. But this building wasn't always a creepy shell of a medical institution. Once upon a time, it was a state-of-the-art tuberculosis sanitarium that offered the latest treatments for one of the most dangerous diseases of all time. The building helped cure those people. A successful program helped eliminate the disease, and the building became a psychiatric hospital. There is no history of foul play at the hospital, the patients, by all accounts, were treated well and the hospital was purposeful. But with declining budgets, the hospital was closed and there were few serious offers from the private sector willing to take it on. From the early 90s, the building stood empty and over time became a relic. Screams were heard in the night, cries of pain, figures were seen running past the windows. 
moving shadows were seen inside the building. Locals complained that the hospital was cursed and wanted something done about it. A deal came forward and the hospital was nearly sold, but asbestos was found in the original structure and nobody wanted to pay to fix the problem. The deal fell through and the hospital was demolished. Senior housing was built on the land and the paranormal stories are still told. Now, instead of a feeling of dread felt by those near the hospital, those feelings are felt by those living in the housing. The figures are still seen, the overall negative feeling of the place still exists. It seems you can destroy the building, but you can't destroy those who linger. A stone throw away from where I grew up stands the beautiful Burton Agnes Hall. It was built in the late 1600s by one Sir Henry Griffith, the second baronet of Burton Agnes. He planned a grand home for his family that included three daughters, and the entire family took great interest as the home was being built. His youngest daughter, Anne, whose painting now hangs in the hall, was particularly interested in the design and building of the house. She was said to be the prettiest of his daughters, and one can well imagine her visiting with her father to inspect progress. However, tragedy was to strike, as one day, when Anne was taking a trip in the local countryside, she and her party were set upon by robbers. They beat her half to death, and she was rushed back home to the hall, where she later succumbed to her injuries. Before she died, she did have one last request, and that was that part of her be interred in the hall so that she could enjoy it through eternity. Her family must have been quite upset at her peculiar request to have her head removed and placed inside one of the walls of the hall. Of course, the family did nothing of the sort, and instead had her buried properly nearby. That, however, was the start of the troubles. The hall was filled with strange bumps and bangs and a horrendous wailing sound such that no one could possibly stay there. Finally, in despair, the family had their daughter's body exhumed, the head severed, and brought back to the hall. No sooner than that was done than peace reigned once again at the picturesque hall. Unfortunately, one day a cleaner finding the skull decided that it should be discarded. The wailing, banging, and crashing resumed until the skull was restored to its place in the hall. Over the next centuries, the skull would be removed from the house and even buried in the garden, but each time the hall was haunted by the wailing, screaming, and thrashing around of poor Anne. These days, the skull is said to be safely hidden behind one of the paneled walls of the hall, and for now, anyway, peace reigns at Burton Agnes Hall. If you love Downton Abbey and you catch all the period dramas you can get your hands on, you may be sold on the idea of living in a Georgian mansion with servants, hunting meats, and grand balls. You may even be planning a trip to visit one of the many beautiful estates that scatter the United Kingdom, Chatsworth, Calk Abbey, or even Buckingham Palace. However, if you are traveling through Derbyshire, you may happen to see the ruined shell of Sutton Scarsdale Hall above you as you drive on the freeway. You may be tempted to visit, and visit you can, it's free. You will park in front of a great ruin and see its splendor, and you will want to investigate. Go ahead, but you may want to keep your eyes open and your car keys close to hand. Why? Because the place is reputed to be haunted. In its day, Sutton Scarsdale Hall was said to be one of the finest houses in the Derbyshire area, even rivaling the interior of Chatsworth House. It is now a shell, standing proudly on a hill overlooking the Bolsover Valley. The original building was of great beauty and grandeur until it was sold 
and then went into great disrepair. In the 1920s, parts of it were auctioned off and allegedly even sold to film sets. By 1946, the building had deteriorated so much that demolition was scheduled, but an emergency rescue was successful thanks to Sir Osbert Stilwell that allowed the shell to be preserved. The once grand house now stands as a ruin. It's without a roof or even floors, but some of its grand fittings and fixtures remain, almost a living memory. Some of the people who once lived there seem to have remained since people have often reported cold spots in the grounds, strange apparitions, the smell of tobacco and shadows lurking in the corners. Witnesses have reported a gray figure wandering the graveyard towards the church. Could this be a resident of that very graveyard? A ghostly figure has been seen haunting the adjacent church porch. It is said to be the spirit of one of the owners of the house. Many people have complained of being followed across the grounds by a strange man who never quite catches up with them. Then there's the cellar. Although you can no longer go down in the deep cellar beneath the old house, there are numerous reports of movement within this part of the building, such as footsteps and even a ghostly arm that appears out of thin air and beckons you to enter. Specters have been seen walking around the grounds, and no visitor ever complains about feeling lonely at the hall. If you're passing through and you love Downton Abbey, you may want to check out the architecture, the view, the history. But beware of the ghosts and do not go down into the cellar. You may find yourself lost in the caverns that run under one of the lost houses of British aristocracy. I had cancer when I was four years old. At that time, back in 1977, I had one of the rarest forms of cancer in kids. One day I was wheeled to a room, ready to go into surgery. As I was being wheeled in, I saw an old man next to me who had just come out of surgery. I asked him why he was there, and he turned to me and he said, Oh, honey, I had surgery on my heart but I didn't make it. He assured me not to worry and told me that I was going to be fine, and then he simply faded away. The nurse came in and I asked her, where did the man go? And she asked, what man, honey? You're the only one here. How do you make money from a rental property that you can't rent. A seven-bedroom house in Hull, known as the Hostel, has made the headlines recently for all the wrong reasons. Its owner left the home shortly after moving in as a result of the atmosphere and strange occurrences. He tried to rent it, but the longest-lasting tenant managed just four days. Even trying to have remedial work done on the home is an issue, the last workman who showed up left in a hurry without their tools and told the owner he could keep them. They were not going back to the house again. People who have been there report being strangled and pulled around by spirits. One previous owner called the police after being strangled in bed and then dragged across the bedroom by invisible forces. The police didn't know what to make of it, but no crime had been committed. As they left, a bookcase fell on them. The current owner tells of the shadow of a child that emerged from a fireplace. He was so scared he didn't move for over 15 minutes. Passers-by see children and other figures at the windows, despite the home being empty and the police have been called on many occasions. Mediums who have visited the home suggest that the house was once used as a place to care for terminally ill children who, instead of being looked after, were abused, tortured, and killed. The cupboard under the stairs is the focus of much of the activity, as this was where children were locked and left to die. Objects move around, some flying across the room, and doors open and shut by themselves. 
the owner once left the kitchen momentarily to find his steak knives carefully rearranged. Visitors report being strangled, pushed, and generally a very scary atmosphere. Some have vomited once inside. So what do you do with the house you can't rent? You open it up to ghost hunters and thrill seekers. You too can spend a night in this very haunted house in Hull, if you are brave enough. On November 6, 1860, former Illinois Congressman Abraham Lincoln defeated three other candidates for the American presidency, John Breckinridge, John Bell, and Stephen Douglas, and became the most beloved and most hated president in American history, and later that night experienced an eerie vision that he believed was a premonition of the future. In November 1860, Lincoln was home in Springfield, Illinois. The city had a carnival-like atmosphere, and Election Day dawned with rousing cannon blasts, with music and contagious excitement. Lincoln spent the day and evening with friends at the telegraph office. By midnight, it was clear that he had been elected President of the United States. A late-night dinner was held in his honor, and then he returned to the office for more news. Guns fired in celebration throughout the night. Lincoln finally managed to return home in the early morning hours, although news of victory and telegrams of congratulations were still being wired to his office. He went into his bedroom for some much-needed rest and collapsed on a settee. Near the couch was a large bureau with a mirror on it, and Lincoln stared for a moment at his reflection in the glass. His face appeared angular, thin, and tired. Several of his friends suggested that he grow a beard which would hide the narrowness of his face and give him a more presidential appearance. Lincoln pondered this for a moment and then experienced what many would term a vision, an odd vision that Lincoln would later believe had prophetic meaning. He saw in the mirror that his face appeared to have two separate yet distinct images. The tip of one nose was about three inches away from the tip of the other one. The vision vanished but appeared again a few moments later. It was clearer this time, and Lincoln realized that one of the faces was actually much paler than the other, almost with the coloring of death. The vision disappeared again, and Lincoln dismissed the whole thing to the excitement of the hour and his lack of sleep. The next morning, he told Mary of the strange vision and attempted to conjure it up again in the days that followed. The faces always returned to him, and while Mary never saw them, she believed her husband when he said that he did. She also believed she knew the significance of the vision. The healthy face was her husband's real face and indicated that he would serve his first term as president. The pale, ghostly image of the second face, however, was a sign that he would be elected to a second term, but would not live to see its conclusion. Lincoln dismissed the whole thing as a hallucination, or an imperfection in the glass, or so he said publicly. Later, that strange vision would come back to haunt him during the turbulent days of the war. It was not Lincoln's only brush with prophecy, either. One day, shortly before the election, he spoke to some friends as they were discussing the possibilities of civil war. Gentlemen, he said to them, you may be surprised and think it strange, but when the doctor here was describing a war, I distinctly saw myself, in second sight, bearing an important part in that strife. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. 
It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. On November 4, 1842, future President Abraham Lincoln married Mary Todd in Springfield, Illinois. It was a complicated and often turbulent marriage, but Mary remained devoted to Abraham throughout his entire life and even after his death. The two met at a Christmas party in Springfield in 1839. They were attracted to each other from the start. Mary's sister soon noted with disapproval that when Lincoln would call, he would sit in rapt attention to everything Mary said. She believed the young man who the wealthy family considered to be unsuitable was paying far too much attention to Mary. Mary seemed to be returning his attentions for a time, but the following year found her still being courted by other men, including Lincoln's rival Stephen Douglas and Lincoln still pining away after her. At the close of the year, he made his decision. He would marry her. Whether or not Lincoln formally proposed to her or not, Mary promised to become his wife. For some reason, though, on New Year's Day, 1841, Lincoln decided to break off the engagement. Some have speculated that Lincoln was intrigued by the idea of marriage, but afraid of it also. He feared his loss of freedom, but was unsure that he wanted to live without Mary. His friend and law partner, William Herndon, noted that Lincoln was acting as crazy as a loon. He didn't eat. He didn't sleep. He let his work slide and refused to meet and dine with friends. Another friend, Dr. Anson Henry, suggested that Lincoln take a trip out of town and try to ease his state of mind. A short time before, one of Lincoln's closest friends, Joshua Speed, had moved to Louisville, Kentucky, and so Lincoln decided to travel there and stay with him for a little while. Unfortunately, things were no better for him in Louisville. Speed was also in the midst of a turbulent relationship with a local woman named Fanny Henning. After a short visit, Speed returned to Springfield with Lincoln and wrapped up his business affairs to move to Kentucky permanently. He would soon be marrying Fanny, but he left his good friend with one piece of advice. Either give up Mary for good, or marry her and be done with it. In the summer of 1842, Lincoln again turned his attentions to Mary Todd. A friend cleverly arranged a surprise dinner so the two of them would meet again, and it worked. By November, marriage was on Lincoln's mind again. In fact, it was so much on his mind that on the morning of November 4, he and Mary announced they were going to be married that same evening. Their friends were in great haste to make the preparations, surprised by the announcement. There was no time for Joshua Speed to travel from Kentucky, so Lincoln asked another friend, James Matheny, to stand in as best man. Matheny would later write that during the ceremony, Lincoln looked and acted like a lamb being led to the slaughter. While he was getting dressed, his landlord's son asked him where he was going, and Lincoln answered, To hell, I suppose. Despite the haste in making arrangements and Lincoln's obvious foreboding, the ceremony proceeded without a hitch, and Lincoln was now a husband. The Lincolns had their honeymoon at the Globe Tavern, where they lived during the first years of their marriage. There was every indication that their marriage was a happy one, despite Mary losing track of her socialite friends and her sister's warnings that her husband was unsuitable. It was not long before they were expecting their first child, and Robert was born just three days short of nine months after the wedding. During the Civil War and the Lincoln's years in the White House, their son Willie died, a loss from which Mary never recovered. It was during this time that she turned to spiritualism and seances began to be held at the White House. 
Mary seemed to feel great relief from her contact with the dead, but later, after Lincoln was assassinated and spiritualism fell out of popular favor, it would revive again in the early 1900s, spiritualism would become her undoing. For months after Lincoln's death, Mary spoke of nothing but the assassination until her friends began to drift away, their sympathy at a breaking point. She began to accuse her husband's friends and his cabinet members of complicity in the murder, from his bodyguards to Andrew Johnson. Mary lay in her bed for 40 days after the assassination, and in the years that followed, she deteriorated mentally and physically into a bitter old woman who wore nothing but black mourning clothing for the rest of her life. Her attachment to spiritualism turned into a dangerous obsession, reaching a point where she could not function without aid from her spirit guides. Mary had a great fear of poverty. She often begged her friends to help her with money. Unlike the widows of generals and governors, for whom money was easily raised, Mary's handful of supporters found it impossible to raise funds on her behalf because she was just too unpopular. In fact, she was despised across America. Newspapers wrote unflattering stories about her, and she was ridiculed by members of Washington society. In 1868, she abandoned America and took her son Tad to live in Germany. They lived there in hiding for three years before coming home. In July 1870, Congress approved a lifetime pension for Mrs. Lincoln of $3,000 per year. This pension awaited her when she returned to America, as did an inheritance from Lincoln's estate. She was finally a wealthy woman. The sphere was over, but heartbreak soon followed. Travel and an ocean crossing had dire circumstances for Tad. He developed tuberculosis, and his health began to fail. He lingered for many weeks and then died in July 1871. Tad's death, which followed the death of two other children and her husband, further aggravated Mary's grief, which was enhanced by her previous history of mental instability. Mary turned to the only thing that she believed that she had left – spiritualism. For a time, she moved into a commune where she began to develop her psychic gifts, which enabled her to see spirit faces and communicate beyond the veil. She claimed to have a daily conversation with her late husband. Many took advantage of her, tricking her out of money and using her name to promote their own abilities. One of these was so-called spirit photographer William Mumler, who produced thousands of blatantly fake photographs of ghosts during his infamous career. Although he claimed not to recognize Mary when she called at his studio, he miraculously managed to produce a photo of her and her late husband by deft manipulation of the photographic plates. Mary's sole surviving son, Robert, a rising young Chicago lawyer, was alarmed as his mother's behavior became increasingly erratic. In March 1875, during a visit to Jacksonville, Florida, Mary became absolutely convinced that Robert was deathly ill. She traveled to Chicago to find him in fine health. On her arrival, she told her son, that someone had tried to poison her on the train, and that a wandering Jew had taken her pocketbook but would return it later. While staying with Robert in Chicago, Mary spent money lavishly on useless items, such as draperies that she never hung and elaborate dresses that she never wore due to the fact that she only wore black after her husband's assassination. She often walked around the city with $56,000 in government bonds sewn into her petticoats. She was afraid of banks and still feared losing all of her money. After Mary had an episode during which it was feared she would jump out the window to escape a non-existent fire, the family began to feel that she was going insane. Fearing that his mother was a danger to herself, Robert was left with no choice but to have Mary committed to a psychiatric hospital in Batavia, Illinois in 1875. After the court proceedings had ended, Mary was so enraged that she attempted suicide. She went to the hotel pharmacist and ordered enough laudanum to kill herself. However, the pharmacist caught on to her plans and substituted the drug with a harmless liquid. On May 20, 1875, she arrived at Bellevue Place, a private upscale sanitarium in the Fox River Valley. With his mother in the hospital, 
Robert Lincoln was left with control of Mary Lincoln's finances. By this time, Robert was wealthy in his own right and had no plans for his mother's money, which Mary refused to understand. She was sure that he planned to steal everything from her. Three months after being installed in Bellevue Place, Mary Lincoln engineered her escape. She smuggled letters to her lawyer and his wife, who was not only her friend, but also a feminist lawyer and fellow spiritualist. She also wrote to the editor of the Chicago Times, known for its sensational journalism. Soon the public embarrassment Robert had hoped to avoid was looming, and his character and motives were in question. The director of Bellevue, who at Mary's trial had assured the jury she would benefit from treatment at his facility, now in the face of potentially damaging publicity, declared her well enough to go to Springfield to live with her sister as she desired. Mary was released into the custody of her sister, Mrs. Elizabeth Edwards, in Springfield, and in 1876 was once again declared competent to manage her own affairs. The committal proceedings led to Mary severing all ties with Robert. She called him a wicked monster and despised him for the rest of her life. Before she died, she wrote spiteful letters to him, cursing him and telling him that his father had never really loved him. Mary went into exile again and moved into a small hotel in France. Her eyes were weakened by cataracts and her body was racked with pain from severe arthritis. She refused to travel back to the United States until several bad falls left her nearly unable to walk. Her sister pleaded with her to come home and finally she returned to Springfield, moving into the Edwards house, the same house where she and Lincoln had been married years before. Mary lived the last years of her life in a single room, wearing a money belt to protect her fortune. She kept all of the shades in her room drawn and spent her days packing and unpacking her 64 crates of clothing. She died in July 1882 at the age of 63, a faded shell of the exuberant young socialite that she had once been and a sad victim of the Lincoln assassination who found herself cursed to live for 17 years after the death of her beloved husband. Just three days after the 1948 election, President-elect Harry S. Truman stepped off a train in St. Louis and with a large grin on his face, held up a copy of the November 3 edition of the Chicago Tribune for reporters and photographers to see. The bold headline on the front page read, Dewey Defeats Truman. The newspaper had most definitely gotten the story wrong. The headline became known as the most infamous blunder in American newspaper history. The Tribune, which had once referred to Truman as a nincompoop, was a notoriously Republican-leaning paper, but to be fair, the erroneous headline had nothing to do with national politics. For almost a year before the 1948 election, the printers who operated the linotype machines at newspapers all over Chicago had been on strike. Around the same time, the Tribune had switched to a method in which copy for the paper was composed on typewriters, photographed and then engraved onto printing plates. This process required the paper to go to press several hours earlier than usual. On election night, the earlier press deadline required the first post-election issue of the Tribune to go to press before even the states on the East Coast had reported all of the results from polling places. The paper relied on its veteran Washington correspondent and political analyst Arthur Sears Henning for a prediction of the winner. Henning had correctly picked the winner in four out of five presidential contests over the past 20 years. The scuttlebutt in Washington, based on the polls, was that a win by Thomas Dewey was inevitable. The New York governor, almost everyone believed, would easily win the election. The first edition of the Tribune for November 3, therefore, went to press with the banner headline, Dewey Defeats Truman. The story that accompanied it, written by Henning, reported that Dewey won a sweeping victory in the presidential election yesterday. He also noted that Republicans would now control both the Senate and the House of Representatives and that Dewey won the presidency by an overwhelming majority of the electoral vote. As returns began to indicate a close race later in the evening, 
Henning continued to stick to his prediction. It was simply too late to turn back now. Thousands of papers were rolling off the presses with the headline that predicted Dewey's victory. Even after the paper's lead story was rewritten to emphasize local races and to indicate the narrowness of Dewey's lead in the national race, the same banner headline was left on the front page. Only late in the evening, after press dispatches began to cast doubts on Dewey's victory, did the Tribune change the headline to Democrats Make Sweep of State Offices for the later edition. Some 150,000 copies of the paper had already been printed before the mistake was corrected. As it turned out, Truman won the electoral vote by a 303 to 189 to 39 majority over Dewey and third candidate Strom Thurmond. Instead of a Republican sweep of the White House and retention of both houses of Congress, the Democrats not only won the presidency, but also took control of the Senate and the House of Representatives. Harry Truman was on his way back to the White House, a place that he already knew was infested with ghosts. According to a number of former presidents, their families, and their staffs, there are many ghosts to be found in the White House. Most notable among the resident spirits are former chief executives Andrew Jackson and Abraham Lincoln. Of course, these phantoms do not walk the halls alone, but Lincoln is especially active in a place where he suffered not only the psychological trauma of the country tearing itself apart during the Civil War, but where he lost his beloved son Willie to an unknown ailment. Perhaps for this reason he has become the most frequently encountered spirit at the White House. Theodore Roosevelt admitted to friends that he had encountered Lincoln's ghost. Grace Coolidge once insisted that she had seen Lincoln's ghost walking through a doorway on the second floor. President Herbert Hoover described to friends fantastic strange noises that he heard coming from the other side of the door to the Lincoln bedroom. Lady Bird Johnson and Jackie Kennedy both encountered the mournful spirit, as did Eleanor Roosevelt and several members of her staff. Queen Wilhelmina of the Netherlands, who stayed at the White House during World War II, surprised President Franklin D. Roosevelt and several cocktail party guests one evening when she told them of seeing Lincoln in her bedroom. Prime Minister Winston Churchill never discussed Lincoln's ghost, but always stayed in the Lincoln bedroom when visiting the White House. One morning, though, he was discovered sleeping in a room across the hall. He had moved in the middle of the night he refused to tell anyone what had frightened him out of his usual quarters. Of all the presidents who encountered the spirits of the White House, however, the best known was Harry Truman. His daughter Margaret also saw Lincoln's ghost walking down a second-floor corridor, just as many others had in years past. Truman made no bones about the fact that he believed the White House to be haunted. He once recalled an incident that took place in the early morning hours, about one year after he took office. He was awakened that night by knocking on his bedroom door. He got out of his bed, went to the door, and opened it, but found that no one was in the hallway. Suddenly the air around him felt icy cold, but the chill quickly faded as President Truman heard footsteps moving away from him down the corridor. He later wrote to his wife, Bess, who often stayed at their family home in Missouri, because she didn't like Washington, and stated that, I sit in this old house all the while listening to the ghosts walk up and down the hallway. At four o'clock, I was awakened by three distinct knocks on my bedroom door. No one was there. Damn place is haunted, sure as shooting. Stories of ghosts, hauntings, and seances have long swirled about the White House. The spirits of several former presidents are rumored to walk the halls of this stately building. Many of those presidents expressed an interest in spiritualism and the occult, including Franklin Pierce and Abraham Lincoln during their lifetimes, and others claimed to witness the spirits of their predecessors while in office. A few of the first ladies who accompanied their husbands into office also had connections to the supernatural. Mary Lincoln was famous for the seances that she attended after the death of her son Willie and her devout in spiritualism after the death of her husband. 
but there is no first lady who was more expert on the occult or believed more thoroughly in the supernatural than Florence Harding, wife of scandal-battered President Warren G. Harding. During his time in office, Harding was a popular president, but his reputation was tarnished after his death when Americans learned of the corruption that occurred during his administration. Even though Harding himself was never accused of criminal wrongdoing, it was during this time that the Teapot Dome scandal came to light. The incident involved Secretary of State Albert Fall, who rented public lands to oil companies in exchange for bribes and gifts. He was later convicted and served less than a year in prison. Other government officials took payoffs and embezzled funds. Harding himself allegedly had extramarital affairs and drank alcohol in the White House in violation of the prohibition laws. Harding died in a San Francisco hotel in 1923 under strange circumstances. The White House initially said he died from food poisoning. Another physician stated that it was due to cerebral hemorrhage, and still another claimed that it was a heart attack. Still others claimed that Mrs. Harding herself may have had a hand in her husband's death. She refused to allow an autopsy on her husband. Since Harding died in California, a state without a mandatory autopsy law, even the president could not be examined without his wife's consent. Several conspiracy theorists began to wonder what she was hiding. One rumor stated that the president, depressed and fearing impeachment once the scandals in his administration came to light, committed suicide. Another claimed that Mrs. Harding had poisoned him, either to prevent the humiliation of scandal from the wrongdoers who worked for him or out of revenge for his many marital indiscretions, including a long-time affair with a woman named Nan Britton, who bore a child with Harding out of wedlock. Still others dismissed such stories and said that Harding merely died from a stroke. The true cause of Harding's death remains a mystery, but at least one person tried to discover what happened to him in the days that followed his demise. That person was his wife, Florence Harding, who tried very hard to hold a conversation with his spirit while his body was still lying in state in the White House. Warren Harding had been born in Ohio on November 2, 1865. After college, he got into the newspaper business in Marion, Ohio, and quickly converted the editorial platform to support the Republican Party. He enjoyed some success until he began to clash with local political leaders, especially real estate magnate Amos Hall Kling. He attracted a lot of unwanted attention, but refused to give up the fight eventually making his paper the largest in the region. On July 8, 1891, Harding married Florence Mabel Kling DeWolf, a tall, mannish-looking divorcee and daughter of political enemy Amos Hall Kling. When he heard the news, he disowned his daughter and even prevented his wife from attending their wedding. He spent the next eight years in opposition of the marriage, refusing to speak to his daughter or son-in-law. Florence quickly took control of the Harding marriage. It became her business sense that made Harding a financial and then political success. She ran the newspaper with crisp efficiency and plotted Harding's rather unlikely political ascent. She pushed him into state politics in the late 1890s, serving in the Ohio Senate for four years before winning election as the lieutenant governor. His time in office was undistinguished and he returned to private life in 1905. But Florence did not let him stay there for long. In 1912, she wrangled him the chance to give the nominating speech for incumbent President William Taft at the Republican convention. In 1914, with the help of political boss Harry Daughtry, Harding was elected to the U.S. Senate. During his time in the Senate, Harding missed over two-thirds of the roll calls and votes, compiling one of the worst records in history. He introduced only 134 bills none of them significant. But Harding was an affable man and was always well-liked by his colleagues. He was a loyal party man and worked to keep harmony. This turned out to be a great help to him in 1920 when a deadlocked Republican convention turned to Harding as a compromise candidate for the presidency. After a particularly nasty campaign, the first to ever shine light on the candidate's sex life, Harding won the election by a wide margin. 
his administration soon became riddled by scandal and corruption. Florence may have pushed her husband into the White House, but she had no idea what awaited him there. In that way, at least, her belief in spirits and signs didn't help her. Florence had always believed in spirits, omens, and curses. Some believe that she came by those beliefs from the German immigrant families who rented farms owned by her father in Ohio, or perhaps it came from her visits to spiritualist camps in Indiana in the late 1800s. She read tarot cards and believed in bad luck. In the White House, she became agitated if a maid placed a pair of shoes on a bed, believing that it brought bad luck. A niece later told a story of Florence gazing up into the night sky, identifying the constellations and explaining that the only aspect of life that could truly be relied upon was what messages were given to us by the formations of the stars. It's no surprise that Florence turned to the supernatural for guidance. Her life was one of abuse, by her first husband, her father, and even by her husband who carried on with other women right under her nose. She also suffered from a chronic kidney ailment that made her life painful and her lifespan unknown. When Florence arrived at the White House, she threw herself into the job of First Lady. She opened the mansion and the grounds to the public again. Both had been closed during President Wilson's illness and began organizing social events for veterans, women's groups, and various dignitaries. Among those with open invitations to the White House were spiritualists, mediums, and psychics. Spiritualism had become a popular movement again after World War I, and seances were widely attended across the country. Critics of the Harding administration openly complained about the parade of psychics that were meeting with the First Lady. Harry Houdini, who appeared before a congressional committee to ask for laws against fortune-tellers and fraudulent mediums, even said that he'd heard on rather good authority that they held seances in the White House. Ironically, though, neither Warren or Florence Harding were ashamed of the fact that Florence believed in spirits or astrology. For his part, Harding never criticized his wife's beliefs nor attempted to prevent her seeking guidance from them, even when her beliefs were exposed during the 1920 presidential election. Among the many mediums and astrologers that Florence consulted, the one who played the biggest role in her life was a woman named Marcia Champre, who used the professional name of Madame Marcia. After Florence became the First Lady, Champre would often go into clairvoyant trances so that she could warn about administration officials who she sensed were involved in malfeasance or plotted against the president. Her primary service to Florence, though, was to interpret the Zodiac for her. During the 1920 presidential primary, Florence was introduced to Madame Marcia by her closest friend, Evelyn Walsh McLean, owner of the infamous Hope Diamond. Chopre also met with the wives of three U.S. senators, veiled for anonymity, and was presented with each of their husbands' birthplace, time, and dates, seeking to determine which of them would be most likely to win the election. Champre determined that Harding would be nominated and win the general election, but at the cost of his life. This prediction, although not the sole reason, did influence Harding's decision to run for president. It was Florence who tipped off the press corps about having consulted an astrologer. She announced at the 1920 Republican National Convention that, if my husband is elected, I can see but one word hanging over his head. Tragedy, tragedy. Once Florence was in the White House, she would send her Secret Service agent, Harry Barker, to bring Madame Marcia from her home. Hoping to spare her husband any embarrassment, she always had her brought in the West Wing entrance, where the visitor's book was not always signed. This was, as it turned out, not Marcia's first time in the White House. The previous First Lady had also consulted her. Edith Galt met Madame Marcia in 1914 and the medium told her that she would someday become a member of the presidential family and live in the White House. Mrs. Galt told her that if the prediction turned out to be true, Marcia would be invited to the White House for further consultations. After the widow met and married President Woodrow Wilson, she was true to her word. As was allegedly predicted, President Harding did die during his presidency. 
Florence endured the long train from San Francisco to Washington with her husband's body, and on the first night that the flag-draped casket was resting in the East Room, Florence asked her friend, Evelyn McLean, to descend the grand staircase with her so that she could speak with her dead husband. The flag was removed by White House staff members, and the casket was opened so that husband and wife could converse face to face. Whether Harding ever apologized to Florence for his many transgressions from beyond the grave is unknown. After Harding's funeral, his body was returned to Marion, Ohio, where he was laid to rest. Florence followed him to the grave, dying on November 21, 1924, surviving her husband by little more than a year of illness, sorrow, and pain. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them, and they said yes. So now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low-carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. This incident took place a few years ago. I had no interest at all in the paranormal until this occurrence. I was home alone as my parents were out for the evening, and I was in the living room of our house on my laptop. My laptop is set up so that my back is to the wall. From there, I have a clear view of our kitchen. I was browsing different websites. One of my dogs, Casper, was curled up on the chair next to me. I heard some loud noises coming from upstairs, but ignored it, assuming that it was our other dog playing around up there. At one point, I thought I heard someone step down a few stairs and pause, but I continued to ignore it. Suddenly, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black outline go down the last few steps of the stairs. Usually, with the lamp on, I would be able to see anyone coming downstairs, but in the darkness, I could only make out black. At the exact same moment that I saw this, Casper jumped up, faced the stairs, and started barking at the moving mass. I quickly turned my head toward the stairs, but only caught a glimpse of the black figure turning to the right. Casper stayed next to me, barking. He seemed to be following something with his eyes something that was headed towards the kitchen. I could hear footsteps on the wooden floor as it approached, but right when someone should have walked into the kitchen, the footsteps stopped. As soon as I got over the shock, I searched the hallway and the rest of the house. No one was there. I believe I saw something that night, but I haven't seen it since. Is it possible for just one occurrence to take place?
It was around 11 p.m. and we were getting ready for bed. We turned off all the lights and turned off our cell phones. Just as we were drifting off to sleep, my phone rang. I picked up my phone and noticed that the caller ID said, John. I just thought my husband John was messing around. I turned and asked him why he was calling me. He just replied that he wasn't. He picked up his phone and showed me that it was turned off. On a few occasions, I would leave my laptop on at night and let it rest in sleep mode. Both my husband and I sleep lightly, so we would wake at the slightest sound or crack of light. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and being blinded by light. Once my eyes adjusted to the light, I saw that my laptop was no longer sleeping and the lid had been opened. Something strange was happening. After this, my computer would malfunction all the time. My mouse wouldn't work, my printer wouldn't connect, and the internet would drop off all the time. One night, I was taking a shower. I stepped out to dry myself and saw that someone had written hello in the mist that covered the mirror. Some very strange things have been going on in our house. I don't think it's anything dangerous, but I do think someone is trying to get in touch with me. What do you think? My mother died suddenly when I was a teenager, and as a way of keeping her memory alive, my father thought it would be a good idea for me to wear her cross. He told me that he would come to my dorm at college that weekend and bring it with him. When he arrived, he went to get the envelope out of his jacket pocket. He couldn't find it. More than a little bit worried, he went and searched the entire car to see if it might have fallen out. Not finding it there, he went back home and tried to find it, but had no luck. Finally giving up, he went about the events of the day feeling very bad for having lost the cross that he promised me. The very next day, my father drove my brother back to the college, and after parking, they both went to get out of the car to say goodbye before my brother had to attend class. When my father opened the door and looked down at the ground, there was the cross, lying between his feet. Now, it was the middle of the day at a busy college and in the middle of the parking lot, just the cross lying on the cold, hard concrete. To this very day, we have no idea how it got there. Was this a sign from my mother? I'm female, married, and 51 now, but when I was in my early 30s, single and living alone, I lived at 5 Rearbrook Road, Northfield, Birmingham, UK. The then Longbridge car plant was still there, built in 1905 and demolished in 2005. It was literally just a two-minute walk from my flat. Number 5, as several of the houses on that road and other roads were, I think, was originally built for the plant workers and then converted to bedsit flats. I was on the ground floor, and there was a woman living above me. My living room and bedroom were one room with the bathroom and kitchen separate. I had 26 pet mice and was up at 4 a.m. six days a week for work at 5 a.m. From the second I moved in, there was always the feeling of being very unwelcome in the flat. No matter how much I brightened it with colorful decorating, incense sticks, etc., no matter how light or dark the weather, it was always dark, gloomy, eerie, hostile, suppressive. I hated the place. I'm not religious, but resorted to using crosses and other religious things to try to stop or ease the evil atmosphere. It never worked. I'm fine with ghosts, etc., and have been connected with them all my life, but the whole place was horrible and I had ten miserable years there. 
One morning, while feeding my mice, I was suddenly thumped really hard on my chest by a huge male fist that literally set me flying through the air backwards. I crashed on my back on the shelving unit, taking it with me as I landed. I was wrecked, and my head was banged hard as I landed and my back was in agony. I managed to haul myself up and, thankfully, the mice were okay. Visitors who came for the first time refused to come again, saying they could feel evil and felt like they were being watched. Workmen were reluctant to come in, would leave ASAP, and some made comments that they didn't feel comfortable there. The bruise came up within a couple of minutes, big, painful, and throbbing, shaped just like a huge male fist, and it lasted several weeks. To this day, I still get a bit of pain there occasionally. I showed it to a couple of workmates as proof. I had a nice ghost there also, called Old Bert, who would talk to me and I'd talk back. I'd talk to Bert physically and he'd reply with a sort of telepathy. I actually missed him when I finally managed to leave that horrible place in my early 40s. I told him he could follow me to my new place in Upton, upon Severn, Worcester, if he wants. He said he can't as he's earthbound to that flat. I think he was the elderly gent who died in the flat above before the woman moved in. Bert was playful. I'd go out and make sure all plugs were unplugged, switched off, would come back and they'd all be plugged in and switched back on. A CD I left face up on my bed on the head end where I left for work was face down at the feet end when I came back. I put that down to Bert playing tricks as he hated Doris Day, which is who was singing on the CD. A photo was ripped off the wall. It was of a couple of workmates who are Mormons. It vanished for several weeks, then reappeared by my bed. It wasn't there when I searched for it when it first vanished. My mate, Elaine, a Jehovah's Witness, refused point-blank to get near my flat, saying it was possessed and it scared her. Pictures refused to stay on the wall in one bedroom no matter how strong the nails or hooks were. I saw pictures and photos being physically ripped off that wall. The atmosphere in the kitchen was so violent at times, I grabbed the kettle, toaster, and microwave and moved them to the living room, closed the kitchen door, and I only went in when I absolutely had to. When outside, I got the impression of being watched by someone from the inside. Bert told me he tried to find out who or what was causing the bad things, but had no luck. Mountain Ash is a quiet Welsh mining town located near Carfilly. The General Hospital, a community hospital built partially using deductions from the miners' salaries, was closed in around 2012 with several others in the area to make way for a new and larger hospital. Established in 1910, the hospital served several generations of locals in the area through birth to death. These days, the site has been heavily vandalized, stripped of metal and its slate roof to now sit abandoned and forlorn in the valley. Its only visitors these days are urban explorers and ghost hunters. The town has had its share of paranormal activity, being the site of reported live fish falling from the sky in 1841. Like many abandoned hospitals, its own derelict hospital has gained a reputation for being haunted. Residents, locals, and even ex-workers at the hospital have seen the ghost of a little girl wandering around the hospital, even while it was in use. A former security guard has reported strange noises from some buildings, including screams. However, a recent ghost hunt there produced a very scary video. Professional ghost hunter Lee Smart performed a hunt there recently, capturing a strange image on video of what appears to be a person's head looking out of an upper story window. Whatever it was that was captured quickly pulled itself back into the window when it was noticed. 
The team went to investigate the room and recorded an eerie and scary threat on EVP, with a voice saying, You watch your back, ha ha ha, cause I will kill you. Here is the actual recording. Smart claims his name was called by the phantom presence in the room. The security guard at the site had to move his office from inside the main building to a caravan in the grounds after he became too frightened to stay there. He reported hearing all sorts of noises, including the screams of a little girl and other noises at the site. On several occasions, the police were called to sweep the building because of the noises he heard, but they never found anything to explain the noises. Smart and his team also reported growling noises and the feeling of being watched as they investigated the building. However, the creepiest aspect to the whole night was being threatened by a presence who he says seemed to want them to leave. You can find a link to the original video containing an image of this ghost as well as the EVP in this episode's description. My mother died when I was 17 years old. The night before she died, she ran into my bedroom and woke me up. She told me that there was someone in the house. She was terrified. I told her that I had heard and seen nothing, but she continued to rant about someone being in the house. Eventually, she calmed down and took my father's gun to bed with her. The next day, she died. Nothing paranormal caused her death, just a car accident. After that, I started to see things. I was still terrified of the dark, even as a teenager, and I wouldn't sleep unless I had a nightlight. One night, the light fell off my bedside table. I fixed it, got back into my bed, and saw a figure standing at the bottom of my bed. He was a little opalescent and almost black and white. His skin was white-gray, and he had a white shirt on and black pants, and he just stood there looking at me with an odd grin on his face. I froze. Then I leaped into my bed and pulled the covers over my head and didn't look again until morning, when, naturally, he was gone. I never saw it again, but strange things still happened to me. I'm always misplacing things, and I'll look everywhere for something, and then, after I give up, the item will turn up. I hear whispers at night, and I sometimes see shadows and shapes. I absolutely believe I inherited a gift from my mother. Canuck Chase is a place many have described as tranquil or beautiful, a part of England where few would ever dream of finding anything out of the ordinary. It is a place of dog walkers, fishing, and natural life. It also seems to be a place of unnatural death. There have been several terrifying accounts of black-eyed children in the area, and these accounts seem to be becoming more frequent. A mother and daughter were walking through Birch's Valley when they heard the screams of a young child. By all accounts, they couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl, but the child seemed to be in distress and sounded extremely close to them. The two of them turned and ran towards the source of the scream. They couldn't find the child anywhere and stopped to catch their breath. The mother turned around and saw a girl standing behind her. The girl was no more than nine or ten years old and had her hands over her eyes. The mother asked her how she was. It seemed natural that she had been the one who had been screaming. The girl dropped her hands slowly and placed them by her side. The mother watched in horror as the girl 
opened her eyes and saw that they were completely black. No iris, no white, just completely black. The mother jumped back and grabbed her daughter. The girl disappeared in a second, but the mother said she was chased by strange feelings all day. An earlier account from Canuck Chase came from a married couple who were walking their dog. As they walked through dense woodland, they could hear the sounds of giggling. A child, by all accounts, no taller than three feet in height, appeared out of nowhere. The couple stood watching her and eventually noticed that the girl had completely black eyes. Her head was tilted to one side as though she had been hung. The couple watched as the girl stared at them for a few minutes before running away into a dense area of the forest. The interesting thing about the Canuck Chase sightings is that many of the accounts happen during the day. For those who dare to walk through the forests and overgrowth of the chase, be sure to make sure you don't travel alone. In the early 1970s, in Thornton Heath, England, a family was tormented by poltergeist phenomena that started one August night when they were woken in the middle of the night by a blaring bedside radio that had somehow turned itself on. Not only had the radio managed to turn itself on, but it had turned itself to a foreign language station. This was the beginning of a string of events that lasted nearly four years terrifying one family to the breaking point. A lampshade repeatedly was knocked to the floor by invisible hands. During the Christmas season of 1972, an ornament was hurled across the room, smashing into the husband's forehead. As one member of the family sat down, the Christmas tree started to shake violently. The new year didn't bring any respite for the family due to footsteps in the bedroom, and one night the couple's son awoke to find an older man in clothes from the turn of the 20th century staring down threateningly at him. The family decided to have the house blessed by the local vicar, but even after a prolonged blessing, the phenomena continued. Objects would fly through the air, extremely loud noises were heard, and the family would sometimes hear a noise that suggested some large piece of furniture had crashed to the floor. When they went to investigate, nothing would be disturbed. It was becoming a living hell for the family. The poltergeist still appeared in front of family members, leaving the family in fear. A medium who was consulted told the family that the house was haunted by a farmer by the name of Chatterton, who considered the family trespassers on his property. An investigation bore out the fact that he had indeed lived in the house in the mid-18th century. Chatterton's wife joined in, causing mayhem, and often the tenant's wife would be followed up the stairs at night by an elderly gray-haired woman wearing a pinafore and with her hair tied back in a bun. If looked at, she would disappear back into the shadows. The family even reported seeing the farmer appear on their television screens, wearing a black jacket with wide, pointed lapels, high-necked shirt, and black cravat. After the family moved out of the house, the poltergeist activity ceased, and nothing more has been reported by subsequent residents. What did this family do to incur the wrath of two former tenants of one house? Poltergeist intrusions have always been some of the most fascinating cases in paranormal investigation. From the Enfield haunting, the Amityville house, through to the Monk of Pontefract, much of this activity is well known for being prankish, playful, and, although creepy, it is not particularly harmful. However, there are those cases in which a poltergeist will escalate its activities to a terrifying and intense level running amok with even more impressive displays of strength and power. One such case that has become one of the most incredibly potent poltergeist manifestations of all time was a spooky series of events 
surrounding a young family in a tranquil town in England. This is the case of the South Shields poltergeist. Up until the end of 2005, a young couple and their young son were living a relatively peaceful life in their terraced house in the gentle coastal town of South Shields in the United Kingdom. In December of that year, the family started to experience a series of steadily escalating paranormal incidents that they could not explain, no matter how hard they tried. It started with things like doors suddenly opening or closing on their own when no one was touching them, or strange sounds coming from the walls. After that, furniture and other objects began to seemingly move around on their own, such as chairs found stacked on top of each other upon a table in the bedroom and a large heavy chest of drawers moved from one bedroom to another. In some cases, the mysterious movement was witnessed or heard, such as when furniture could be heard moving about and sliding over the floor of the son's room upstairs when no one was there, as they all cowered in fear on another floor. Other weird occurrences noticed during this time were bangs, thuds, and knocking, which became more and more pronounced, as well as sudden dramatic temperature drops in rooms. This all seems like typical poltergeist activity so far, but things would quickly graduate to even more bizarre and sinister levels when the spirit, or spirits, allegedly began to creepily turn its malevolent attention to the son's toys, which it would turn into instruments of mayhem to terrorize the family further. The first instance of this happened one night as the couple was settling down to go to bed. It was at that point, as the wife began to lay down, that she reported feeling something hit her in the head. It was found that the projectile that thumped to the floor was, oddly, their young son's toy dog. Since the son was not there and there was no one there to have thrown it, neither of them could figure out what was going on. It was not even clear how the toy had gotten into their room to begin with. Moments later, another stuffed toy hit the wife, propelled by an unseen force, this time with greater impact and ferocity. As the couple sat there in the darkened room trying to figure out just what was going on, they were set upon by other toys flying at them and pelting them from all directions, seemingly coming from nowhere and sometimes stopping in mid-air to continue their trajectory. As the terrified couple pulled up the covers to shield themselves, they claimed that something began trying to rip the blankets away from them. As they struggled in a sort of tug-of-war with the mysterious intruder, the husband is said to have suddenly screamed out in pain. It was soon purportedly found that red scratch marks had appeared on his back. Soon after that, the attack stopped as suddenly as it had begun. Oddly, the scratches are said to have completely disappeared by the following morning. From there, the strange entity seems to have become hooked on using children's toys to frighten and panic the family. One time, the family found their son's rocking horse ominously hanging by its reins from the ceiling loft hatch, and on another occasion, the couple was met by the creepy sight of a toy bunny sitting at the top of the stairs with a box cutter placed in its paws. Toys would also often roll across the floor on their own without warning, making eerie moaning sounds or turn on by themselves. Another weird occurrence was when a sink in the bathroom allegedly suddenly seemed to fill with blood to the point of overflowing, which vanished soon after. What was going on in this house? One disturbingly menacing habit that this poltergeist had was leaving threatening messages on the son's doodle board. These messages were typically ominous, aggressive, and peppered with profanity, saying things like, you're dead, just go now, die bitch, RIP, and go bitch now to your ma'am, sometimes joined by strange arcane shapes and symbols scrawled next to them. These messages would graduate from the board to emails and SMS messages that the wife would receive on her mobile phone, which were typically death threats or promises of violence such as, get you bitch, and die now. One such message said, going to die today, going to get you. And another read, I can get you when you awake, and I'll come for you when you asleep, bitch. None of the messages could be tracked to a number or email account, 
and they seemed to come from nowhere. Her cell phone would also be incessantly called by her home number even when she knew there was no one at home. The South Shields poltergeist has often been accused of being merely a prank or hoax played out by the family. But what do you think? Could this family have been under attack from forces unknown? Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. <laughs>